17, uh, chapter 17, verse 1 of, of the portion to talk about, um, um, you know, we're going to try and hit the highlights of the Rashi's. Uh, and I want to talk about the scene of where God commands Rashi, God commands Abraham to, to get a bris, to get a circumcision. So that's going to be our our focus today. Genesis chapter 17, verse 1. Uh, yes. So you got it, my friends? So... What? Yeah, when Abraham was 99. 99 years young. Never says he was 99 years old. Doesn't say that. It, it says earlier that God had blessed Abraham. Abraham grew old. But here, it just says he was 99 years. Doesn't say he was 99 years old. Uh, no, the English puts in old. And also, uh, in fact, the Torah portion twice says the word Zakain, elderly about Abraham. So Rashi says the second time it already mentions he was Zakain. So Rashi says there's an there's an elderly with vigor, and then there's an elderly without vigor. I mean, there's an age, there's an older senior citizen where you've got vigor, where you you come and you participate in activities, and you're and you're engaged with the world, and then there's an old where you're just done, where you're just done, and you're you're giving up and just waiting, waiting to meet your creator. So the first time Raj, he was old, but he was still vigorous. He was old in years, but not in the mentality. But here, but here, it doesn't say he was ninety-nine years old. It just says he was, it just says he was ninety-nine. He was ninety-nine, and so that he could be young. And you'll see he's about to be young because he's about to have a child. Abraham was ninety-nine years. and God appeared to Abraham. and he said to him, Ani kel shadai. I am Kel Shaddai. Walk before me and be per, and be pure. So this is going to be the commandment to be circumcised. So let's see what the Rashi says. When Abraham was 99 years, what does it mean? I am Kel Shaddai. What does that mean? This is the name of God. But what does it mean? Ani Kel Shaddai. What does this name mean? Rashi says, Ani who? I am who? There is in my divinity enough for every creature. Meaning to say, it's a, the name of God, Shaddai, is a contraction of the words, Shayeshdai, there's enough. I have enough for every creature. Therefore, walk before me, and I will be for you a God and a patron. I'll take care of you. I need El Shaddai. I am enough. Just have me and I'll take care of you. And so too, wherever this word, it means, that which is sufficient. It means to say God has, uh, God can, can provide. So God is saying, I am the Kel Shaddai. I provide you with everything and I'm going to tell you how to be perfect. Well, God means Kel and Shaddai. So that's the idea. What does this word Shaddai mean? So Rashi says it means Sheyeshdai, that there is enough. But that's maybe Midrashic, where does Rabbi Stein help explain the translation as mighty? Does he have an explanation of it? So therefore, you know, whenever he says the majority of the commentaries, he means not Rashi, because otherwise he would say Rashi. So he doesn't have to go with the majority of the commentaries. So he's going with the majority, but not Rashi. Okay, so the majority of the commentaries say the Shaddai means mighty. And then he says, walk before me and be perfect. Rashi, remember we said last week, Noah was Ish Tzadik, Tamim Sav, and Noah walked with God. But Avram, said, God says to him, Walk before me. He's supposed to be walking in front of God. Rashi says, this is beautiful, Rashi. Walk before me and be perfect. This is a command. 
Avzet Tzivoy, Achar Tzivoy. This is a command after command. It's not a promise of reward that if you walk before me, you will be rewarded by being perfect. It's a command. That you need to walk before me and you need to be perfect. You need to be perfect. I was one time, you know, I don't like to write the tefillin. When I, the reason why I don't like to write the tefillin, I do it on very rare occasions and people like beseech me, but it's really, I'm asking anybody here not to because I don't like to do it. And the reason is that tefillin have to be perfect. They can't be very good or excellent. They have to be perfect. If you make a mistake, you can't fix it. It has to be perfect. You cannot throw it away. You have to take it and put it in an earthenware utensil and bury it. So it has to be perfect. So this is a command for Abraham to be perfect, like the like the uh, the Air Force pilots who go out on those missions over Iran. They can't be good or very good or excellent. They have to be perfect. And if they're not perfect, they're dead. That's it. That's it. You don't have you don't have a margin of error in certain things. And God is saying to Abraham, "Walk before me and be perfect." Be complete in all my trials. That's, you need to be complete in all my trials which I subject you. That's what it literally means. What kind of trials? That God is going to give Abraham 10 trials. And this is one of the trials. What's the trial going to be? To circumcise himself at the age of 99. Um, uh, midrash, but the Midrash says as follows. Walk before me in the fulfillment of the commandment of circumcision. And with this, you'll be perfect. As long as the foreskin is upon you, you are filled with a blemish. But now, but now, but now you'll do this and you'll be perfect. You'll be perfect. Meaning to say, God says, I created man imperfectly. So now this is what you need to do in order to achieve perfection. You need to circumcise yourself. God has arranged the world so that man can do an act to complete his perfection. Man can do an act to complete his perfection. And God created us imperfectly and this is how you perfect yourself. And that, that's a rash she says here. Another explanation, a third explanation. What does it mean to be perfect? Now you are deficient. You have in five body parts. You have two eyes, two ears, and the male member. I'll add a letter to your name. And the total of your letters will be equal to 248, like the number of your body parts. Meaning to say, Abraham, okay, so the body part, the 240, the, the rabbis had a tradition that there were 248 body parts. So Abraham was deficient in five body parts. Which five body parts? The eyes, the ears, and the male member. So what that means is that when they were exposed to certain things, they can lead him to sin. So how does he exert control over them? He has to battle with his evil inclination. But by circumcising himself, Avram was able to reign over them completely and no longer had to fight the eight Sahara. The letter He was added to Abraham's name as a symbol that he was perfect. And now the, his name says that he has these, these uh, he comes to 248. What's the numerical value of Avram? The ratio is 200, Mem is 40, Aleph and Bet is 243, and then the five comes to 248. So what Rashi is saying is that when you take the hey, we're going to add a hey to Abraham's name, your numerical value will, will represent completely perfection and then you will achieve perfection over your body in that you won't be led to sin so there are a lot of theories in the rabbis as to why what is the spiritual value of circumcising 
some say, then this is what Rashi is referring to, is that it decreases a man's likelihood to sin because it's circumcised. It decreases the the animalistic drive in the body for for sexual pleasure. So that's one of the theories. The other theory is it increases it. So this is those who anybody know intactists. Intactists are people who are anti-circumcision, very very anti it. Big movement, and they uh, argue that it's unfair to the to the child to circumcise him because you're diminishing his ability to to have physical pleasure later in life. So they they argue very strongly against it. As a really made a lot of uh, progress politically in America, but in some countries it has. So we see here three theories about how this is, what this means. One is the word perfect means you have to push yourself to be perfect and, and not fall to my tests. Number two is it means that God is giving us a general commandment. How do we complete our our his work and be and make it perfection by by circumcising and the third way is that when you circumcise yourself abraham's number became abraham's numerical value became complete but more than that abraham will prevent himself from sinning with uh with temptation you have a question shoshana okay so then it says that and i'll please do this i'm going to tell you what to do and then I'll be making a covenant between me and your children. And I will increase you greatly. She says, this is a covenant of love and a covenant of the land of Israel. To pass on to you as an inheritance through the fulfillment of this commandment. Now, one of the uh, theories, another theory as to why we have circumcision is because, you know, like when you uh, cut down a sapling, that the tree grows back stronger. So that, that basically the idea is you circumcise, and that's a method of increasing. That Rashi says, if you, uh, I'll increase you greatly by uh, when you, when I cut you down a little bit, that'll make it grow back stronger. Anybody hear that theory? And that's one of the major theories of, why 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 circumcision was there you know like um break that when you work out a time you break down a muscle and then you come back the muscle grows back stronger the same idea it's a circumcision that this will be a way of increasing your virility all right vaipo avram upon abraham falls on his face when he hears this why is abraham falling on his face because of the awe of the divine presence and God spoke to him. Rashi says, because before he was circumcised, there was no strength in him to stand before God. Well, God stood over him. As it states, my Bilam will fall on him with uncovered eyes. Okay, so now, the fourth verse, right, the Pasuk says, Ani hinei the old my covenant is with you. I'll be a father amongst the nations. I'll be a father amongst the nations. This name, Father Amongst the Nations, Rashi tells us, is an abbreviation of his name, Avraham. The Father Amongst the Nations comes from Avram. Avhamon Gayim sounds like Avraham, except it's missing the Reish. Where is the Reish? Rashi tells us, the letter Reish, the letter Reish is taken out. At first, Avram was only a father. He was only a leader in the place of Aram, where he was from. But then he became a father to the whole world. So, and even though he was now a father to the whole world, we didn't get rid of the Rish. And also, this is a beautiful Rashi. Also, the Yud of Sarai, Sarah's name was originally Sarai, and then it became Sarah. What happened to the Yud of Sarai? This is what Rashi says. 
שאף יוד של שרי נסערמה על השכינה. ויוד של שרי complained to God. said, what happened to my, why am I being dropped? Why am I being dropped? I don't want to be dropped from Sarah's name. I want to be with Sarah. So where did Rashi put that Yud? Well, I mean, where did the Torah, where did Hashem put that Yud? Took the Yud and added it to Joshua's name. Josepho Yoshua, Shanemar Vaikram Moshe, Oshea Ben Nun, Yoshua. Moshe called Oshea the son of Nun, Yoshua. Let me pause for a second and ask you, what is the meaning of this type of, uh, this type of Midrash? That the Yud complains? What's the deeper meaning there? Oh, well, okay, fine, fair, that you're always allowed to complain. I think what it's showing, I think what it's showing is what the Obavitcher everyone said, you know, our lives are so small, all of us. I mean, not, not criticizing you, I'm saying like the man's existence and in one level is so meaningless. How can we find meaning in this world? You know, we're in the rat race. We're... So the Rebbe said, attach yourself to something great. Attach yourself to something great. And then we have meaning by being attached to something great. So these letters are clearly, obviously the letters aren't alive. The letters are not animate creatures. But it's teaching us this idea that we want to attach ourselves to something great in order to have meaning in our life. The Yod didn't want to be unattached, so God attached it to Yoshua. That's the, that's to my mind what the message of this Midrash is. Okay, so then, so uh, the Pazik tells us, You'll no longer be called Avram, Avraham. Now you're going to be Abraham. I made you a father amongst the nations. Uh, she tells us who's the father amongst the nations? Israel and Edom. Abraham was already the father to Yishmael, which became the Arab community. He, he's being told that he's going to be the father to Israel and Edom. The rabbis assumed that Edom was the was the um, Rome. Rabbis assumed Edom was the Roman kingdom. So basically the rabbinic theology is that the whole world comes from the whole world comes from uh, comes from Abraham. That he's the, I mean not the whole world but the, the main the main world the main rabbinic world at the time. Okay, the verse six. And I will increase you greatly. And I'll make you for a nation. When kings shall descend from you. Let's see what this means. King, I will uphold my covenant. What is the covenant? To be a God to you, Rashi says. I will make my covenant between me and you. Bain Zaracha. And I will make my covenant between me and you and your offspring after you through their generations. Be God to you and to your offspring after you. Rash, the Prophet says, He still hasn't told them to do this, this circumcision yet, but he's, he's building up to it. What? Yeah, I mean, yeah, I guess you could say that. And I'll give to you and to your seeds after you, as Eretz Megarecha, the land of your, the land of your sojourns. It's called Eretz Canaan Lachuzat Olam. I'll give you the land of Canaan as the eternal heritage. And I will be for them for a God. Rashi says, and there I'll be for them as a God. But those, oh, this is, oh, this Rashi, I want to say it again, again, again. This is, uh, it might, we have to take this one to heart. Rashi says, what does it mean? I will be for them, uh, the, give them the land of Canaan as an eternal heritage, and I will be for them as a God. 
Rashi says, there I will be for them as a God. But those who live outside of the land of Israel, it's, if you live outside the land of Israel, it's like you're living, it's like one who has no God. So if you live outside the land of Israel, it's like you're living without a God. That's what Rashi says, based upon the Gemara in Ksubos 110b. The charitable way to read this, for those of us who live outside the land of Israel, the most charitable reading of this is that our relationship with God is not as deep as those who live in the land of Israel. But the literal way to read it is you, you, if you live outside the land of Israel, it's like you're living without a God. So obviously this cuts deep because all of us here are living outside the land of Israel. But the basic idea is that's what Rashi is saying. Yeah, let me hear. Right, so I, so the, I agree with you completely that that's not the only way to read this verse. What, what I think cuts deep is is the interpretation that Rashi offers based upon the Talmud, which that I don't think there's another way to read where Rashi says, those who live outside the land of Israel is similar to one who has no God. I mean, I think what I think it means is that there you cannot have a full Jewish life outside the land of Israel. The fullest Jewish life has to be in Israel. Right. Yeah, I, I agree with you. That that's what the text is saying. But I think when I say this, we have to bear in mind that those who said this, those who wrote this sentence, were in the Babylonian Talmud. So they knew, I mean, they were writing it about themselves. They're writing that that they felt that there was something lacking in their Judaism, in their observance of the Torah by being outside of the land of Israel. No, it doesn't say that in the text. It says it in the Rashi. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. 